So you want to through hike the Colorado Trail? First of all, great decision. Second of all, let's talk about how to do it. In this video, I'm going to talk about the logistics of a Colorado Trail through hike, when you should do the hike, where you start, where you end, what are the things you need to know in between. So let's get into it. First and foremost, when should you hike the Colorado Trail? The best time, according to the Colorado Trail Foundation, is from July through September. And as someone who lives in Colorado, I would totally agree with this. I know that people from other states, maybe states where winter isn't as harsh or you don't get as much snow, you might think that this is a short window and seems kind of silly. I mean, summer feels like it starts in May in some places, right? Not in the high country in Colorado. <laughs> we can have snow. Well, first of all, we can get snow any month of the year up in the high mountains. But snow is way more likely to stick on the ground between October and June. And we're may way more likely to get snowstorms between, between October and June. So when I'm going on my like early season hikes up in the high mountains in Colorado in say June, I know that I'm gonna have to deal with usually a lot of snow. I'm gonna be post holing, which means I'm gonna be breaking down through the snow. I'm gonna have to deal with stream crossings that can be pretty intense because of all the melting snow. And I just go in knowing that. And avalanche danger is a real thing in Colorado as well when there is a lot of snow on the ground. So for that reason, and because you are up at high elevation for quite a lot of the Colorado Trail, really your best bet is between July and September and the end of September. So I would try to be off the trail by the beginning of October. I mean, like any place, the weather can really vary, of course. The beginning of October could still be super beautiful up in the mountains. It could still be clear of snow. But you just never know, and you should just plan for the snow to come back to the mountains in early October. Can we get snow in July, August, and September? Absolutely. Absolutely. Colorado gets snow any time of the year. I've been caught in snowstorms up in the mountains in the month of August twice. <laughs> I think the only month I haven't actually seen snow in Colorado, at least like snow falling, is July. But even like in early July this year, I went up to the Aspen Maroon Bells area and I went on a 28 mile backpacking trip with some of my friends. Amazing backpacking trip, by the way. It was in the Maroon Bells wilderness, the four pass loop, very famous. Anyway, in early July, there was still quite a bit of snow on the ground and the stream crossings were like kind of intense. So plan accordingly, July through September is the best time. All right, so where does the Colorado Trail start and end? If you're going the normal direction, which is southbound, southbound is how most people do it, then you're gonna start in Littleton, right outside of Denver, and you're gonna end in Durango. So the trailhead that you start at is the Waterton Canyon Trailhead. If you're coming into Colorado from out of state, you're probably flying, I assume. So you're gonna fly into the Denver airport. The trailhead is about 45 minutes from the Denver airport by car. I would recommend just taking an Uber or a Lyft from the airport. The Colorado Trail Foundation also has a list of shuttle drivers that you can request from them via their website. I'll put the link down in the show notes for that. But honestly, it's just so easy these days to grab an Uber or Lyft. I would just do that and not worry about setting up a shuttle driver ahead of time. You could also take a local bus from the Denver airport into Littleton and make your trip a little uh, shorter so that if you then grabbed an Uber or Lyft from where your bus stop was, it would probably le be less expensive. I personally live in Boulder, so I just took a Lyft from Boulder and it's a, a little tiny bit farther than it is from the Denver airport, but not too much rather it's under an hour and my lift cost me $57 I mean we all know ubers and lifts the cost of them are going up because of gas prices and inflation so who knows by next summer what the cost will be but I thought like $57 for about an hour car ride which I split with my friend Ibex who did the trail with me I mean that's a very reasonable price I didn't have to worry about setting up a shuttle ahead of time. I didn't have to worry about getting someone to drive me there. I mean, like getting a friend or something to drive me there. I just ordered my lift and was on my way. It was super easy. And the Waterton Canyon Trailhead is like not like way out in the wilderness. <laughs> it's like not far off of a highway. 
So if you're thinking like, I can't take an Uber like into the wilderness, well, you, you don't need to, you don't need to. It's a huge trailhead. It's like very well used by hikers and bikers. It's, it's not too far off the beaten path and it's pretty easy to get there via Uber or Lyft. If you are planning to leave a car at the trailhead, well, I wouldn't recommend it because I've had my car die after I've left it for a month just in my apartment, like the battery died. And also Colorado has a huge problem with car theft and catalytic converter theft. So I just, I would not recommend leaving your car unattended for a month in Colorado anywhere, basically. If you're starting in Durango, there is also an airport in Durango. So you can fly directly into Durango. Once you fly into Durango, it's the same thing. You can either set up a shuttle driver in advance to take you to the trailhead, or you can just grab an Uber, a Lyft, or a taxi from the airport. It's only about a 30 minute drive from the airport to the trailhead where the Colorado Trail starts. And then if you start in Denver and you end in Durango, you can either rent a car and drive back to Denver and fly out, or you can just grab a flight from the Durango airport, which is what I did. Hi, it's dark now, so I'm inside, sorry, but I forgot to mention how to actually get to the airport from your trailhead that you end at. So if you end in Durango, you are gonna end at a trailhead that is only 30 minutes from the airport, only a few minutes outside of town, but I personally did not have cell phone reception there. So you could either book a shuttle in advance or it's a pretty popular trailhead. Like I said, it's right near town. So you could just hitchhike out of there, especially if you're not on a tight time constraint and you have to make it back to the airport immediately. It would be fairly easy to hitchhike from that trailhead into Durango. And then in Durango, you'll obviously have cell phone reception. There are Ubers, there are taxis, there are anything you could want you can get in Durango. If you end at Watershed Canyon outside of Denver, you probably will have cell phone reception because I had cell phone service there. And so you could, again, just order, order an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi, or you could try to hitchhike from there. Although it's more likely from that trailhead, people will be going to different places. They could be going to Golden or Denver or Boulder or other surrounding areas. So I think your best bet probably would be to get an Uber or a Lyft or a shuttle if you end at Waterton Canyon. And since I brought up cell phone reception, if you're wondering if you're gonna have cell phone reception on the Colorado Trail, I have Verizon and I did not that often have cell phone service. So I was using my InReach Mini when I really needed to uh, text with people. And if you are unfamiliar with an InReach Mini, it's a GPS, like a satellite communication device. So you can use it to figure out where you are. You can use it to text people. I'll put some more information on that down in the show notes. Um, but my friend Ibex had AT&T and she actually had pretty decent cell phone reception. Like she had it most days. I was really jealous of her because we were trying to play Wordle and most days I could not play, but she could. I'm not sure about any other cell phone carriers. So most people do the trail from Denver to Durango going southbound because if you do it that way, it gives you more time to get used to the elevation. So Waterton Canyon is only at like 5,000 something feet of elevation or like above sea level. And you gradually over the course of like almost 100 miles climb up to the high mountains. If you start the other direction, if you start in Durango, then you you only start at like 6,000 something feet. So that's very comparable, but you get up to the high mountains much quicker. So you're getting within a couple of days from Durango, getting up over 12,000 feet. So if you're not from Colorado, you're not used to the elevation, you don't live in a high elevation place, it's gonna be better for you to start in Denver, unless you're just a rock star dealing with elevation, in which case, more power to you to start in Durango. No permits are required to hike the Colorado Trail. You can just jump on the Colorado Trail wherever you like, start hiking. So how long does it take, does it take to hike the Colorado Trail? Okay, so the CT is 486 miles long if you're taking the traditional Collegiate East route. Add on about six miles if you're taking the Collegiate West route instead of the Collegiate East. But so about 486 miles, and according to the Colorado Trail Foundation, it typically takes people between four and six weeks to complete the trail. 
And you might think that sounds very fast. And I thought so as well. I did it in one month. That is just the time that I had off work. I was filling the space. I had to get it done within a month. And I was honestly nervous about finishing the trail in that amount of time. Like I hike and backpack all the time, but like I'm not someone who likes to pull like 25, 30 mile days on the regular, anything like that. So I was kind of nervous about getting the trail done in that set amount of time, but it is a really well maintained trail. The grade is very reasonable. I found it to be so much easier than the Appalachian Trail. It's actually like, it's it's a multi-use trail. So it, it can be used by bikers and horses and, you know, livestock and all that. So the grading is pretty gentle. And I read from the Colorado Trail Foundation for, that the people who actually built the Colorado Trail as a long hike, they like connected some sections and had to build new parts of the trail in other sections. So they actually very purposefully wanted to make this a reasonable trail to hike. They wanted all types of people to be able to enjoy it. So they wanted to make it fairly easy. And that's really reflected in the trail. Like, I, like I said, I was nervous about making those sorts of miles. I had to average 16 miles a day without even considering taking any zero days. And it was extremely doable. The mileage was extremely doable. And most people are doing the trail in the middle of summer too. So the days are long. So, you know, you get tired, you take a long break and then you get back out there. If you are starting from Waterson Canyon outside of Denver, Something you need to know is that you cannot sleep in the canyon. And it is very, very hot in the canyon in the middle of the day in the summer. Because Colorado down in the lower elevations in the middle of summer is quite hot. It's regularly over 90 degrees. And Waterton Canyon is really exposed. Basically, once you're at Waterton Canyon, you're walking through the canyon on a dirt road for 6.7 miles. I should also mention dogs are not allowed in Waterton Canyon. So you're walking through for 6.7 miles and you are not allowed to camp within those 6.7 miles. So because of the heat in Waterton Canyon in the middle of the day, I would recommend you start early in the morning or in the later afternoon or evening. I started at 5.30 p.m. on a cloudy day. It was still pretty hot, to be honest. Like it could have been cooler. So you have to hike at least 6.7 miles, probably a little further. I think we hiked seven miles our first evening to actually get onto the Colorado Trail where the you know, single track Colorado Trail starts and then you're allowed to camp. So just be aware of that in your planning. If you start at like 7 p.m., you're probably gonna end up having to hike in the dark to get to a place where you can set up camp. Something else to note is, I mean, the so the Colorado Trail is broken up into segments. And I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to what these segments are. The segments are like 16 miles long or something like that. But I did take note that the first few segments are generally really exposed and quite hot. Because again, there's still lower elevation and some of that time you're walking through Waterton Canyon, some of that time you're walking through burned area, some of that time you're just not in the shade of trees. And it's it's more of a scrubby, deserty area. You are going through some trees, but you are in areas that are pretty exposed as well. So I would just recommend, I mean, this is good advice, I think, for the entire Colorado Trail, but especially for these sections, just make sure you have like, pretty good sun protection. You probably want to have a hat. Definitely bring sunscreen, especially because higher at higher elevations, you are more easily sunburnt and nobody wants skin damage. You might want to consider a sun umbrella if you are more sensitive to the sun. My friend Ibex brought a sun umbrella and honestly, I was kind of jealous of it. Anyway, so make sure you bring your sun protection. During your almost 500 mile hike, you're obviously going to need to stop at different places to resupply. So I did a combination of just resupplying at grocery stores in trail towns and actually sending myself some resupply boxes ahead of time. So let me first tell you about the towns that I stopped in. So I did some research ahead of time. I knew I only had a month. I knew I could only stop in a certain number of towns because you have to generally hitchhike into towns. So I decided that I was going to stop in 
Breckenridge, Leadville, Twin Lakes, Salida, Lake City, and Silverton. I didn't spend the night in all of those towns, just a few of them. By the way, I'll put some resources down in the show notes about the trail towns that you can stop at along the way to help you inform your decision. If you want to plan in advance which towns you're going to stop in, these resources could help you out. And I also want to note that I, so as I mentioned, I had to average about 16 miles a day and I didn't want to carry a ton of food if I didn't have to. So I was trying to keep my food carries down under a week. So I think that the longest food carry I had was six and a half days. And I think I had two six and a half day food carries. One of those being right when I started out in Waterton Canyon, because from Waterton Canyon to the jump off for Breckenridge or Frisco, depending on which town you want to go to, either are great options. It's 103.7 miles. So had 103 miles of food. It was very heavy at the beginning, but it, honestly, it wasn't that bad. My trick is I just try to eat my heaviest foods first. And then my other long food carry was between Salida and Lake City. I sent myself resupply boxes to three different towns. So that was to Twin Lakes, which was a great decision. I was happy with that. To Lake City, that was a poor decision. I did not need to do that. It was totally unnecessary. And to Silverton, which was a good decision, just based on the fact that we didn't have a lot of time in Silverton. We didn't have a full day there. So it was nice not to have to go grocery shopping while we were there. In Twin Lakes, there is a general store. The owner is awesome. The general store is great. It's just like a tiny little kind of like camp store basically. So they do cater to backpackers. They have backpacking meals, they have snacks, they have things that you're going to want to pack out, things that you need. But it is really small, so the options are limited and I'm a vegetarian and I can be a little picky. So it was just a nice decision. They let you actually send things to the general store if you're through hiking and you can just pick it up there. They don't charge you or anything like that. They're, they really cater to hikers there. I got some really good advice there too. Like it's just a really nice stop. And then there are a couple of little like food truck type things in Twin Lakes as well that you can stop at and get a meal. There is one in there if you want to spend the night, but Twin Lakes is like tiny, tiny, tiny. But the trail is only like a mile from the village of Twin Lakes. And that's where you go through like right before you get into the collegiates. And the collegiates are pretty intense. So basically you want to have some nice foods and you want to have enough food like as you're going into the collegiates. So it's just nice to be able to send yourself a box of like everything that you love right before you go into the collegiates, which in my opinion are the most difficult part of the Colorado Trail. I sent myself a box to the post office in Lake City and uh, I got I got advice to send myself a resupply box there from my friend Pika who hiked in 2019. But apparently a lot of things have changed in terms of the hiking community in Lake City since 2019. There is a church there that really has tried to bring hikers into the community of Lake City and I think they've done a really phenomenal job at it. They have a shuttle running from the trailhead closest to Lake City every single day at noon in the summer that will bring hikers down into Lake City. They have a hiker center at this church where they have things like an espresso machine, a coffee and tea bar, a charging station, free internet, an art station, just amazing, 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 helpful things for hikers. And they really encourage you to come into the hiker center and hang out there. And they're just so friendly and nice. And then the church also hosts these community led hiker dinners on Sunday nights in the summer where these community members will just come together and hike or hike and cook all of this food for the hikers coming through. And they clap for you as you come in. <laughs> and they let you go to the front of the buffet line. And it's just the coolest thing. And you get to meet all of these wonderful people that live in Lake City. And the community just really welcomes you there. And apparently also since 2019, the general store in Lake City came under new ownership. And now they also cater much more to hikers. Like there are backpacker meals in the general store. And I found things to be very reasonably priced. And there is a 
phenomenal bakery in Lake City as well that I personally packed out like two days worth of food from. I have a huge sweet tooth, but they also have savory things like pizza and like sausage rolls and like, you know, feta and spinach rolls and different things like that. In addition to all of the sweet treats. That looks so good. It all looks so good. So I ended up coming out of Lake City, first of all, with way too much food. And second of all, I mailed myself back like half the stuff before I even left Lake City. So it was just completely unnecessary. And coming from Denver, Lake City is, you're getting toward the end of the trail. I want to say Lake City is at mile like 357 or something. You have like 130 miles left to go. And you get your hiker legs by then. You're doing bigger miles. So you're probably going faster than you anticipate you're going to be going. So I just don't recommend sending a food drop there. And then in Silverton, I stayed at the Avon, which is a historic hotel and hostel. Love the Avon, by the way. My friend Seth is the part owner. I've been there a couple of times now. It's just really welcoming and really caters to hikers. It's awesome. Definitely stay there if you go to Silverton. But at the Avon, they also accept packages for hikers. So... It's just super easy. I was staying there anyway, so I just sent myself a package, and then I was only in Silverton for like half a day, and then the night, and then went back to the trail the next morning. So it was just really nice. I didn't even go in the Silverton um, grocery store, so I'm not even sure how the options are there, but just given my time constraint there, it was just amazing not to actually have to grocery shop. So awesome decision. If I were to do it again, I would still sell myself a box to Twin Lakes, and one to Silverton, but definitely not one to Lake City. In terms of the trail towns that I stopped in, I honestly really, really liked every single trail town that I stopped in. Lake City was definitely my favorite just because the community was amazing. They just, they, it was obvious that they wanted the hikers there. And Actually, my friends and I got a hitch out of Lake City and we were talking to the guy who picked us up, which it took us literally like one minute to hitch out of Lake City. It was crazy because hiking in, or hitching into Lake City was our toughest because it's kind of the most remote trailhead that we stopped at to get to town. Um, and a lot of the people driving by were going the opposite direction. But anyway, getting from Lake City back to the trailhead was super, super easy and quick. And the guy who picked us up asked us like, why did you choose to go to Lake City instead of Creed? And I said, because of the reputation of Lake City, it seems like hikers who come to Lake City love Lake City. And he's like, oh, that's great. That's exactly what we want. So anyway, Lake City is just awesome. It's super cute. There's a river running through it. It's super, super walkable. There are several different places you can get accommodations. There's an amazing bakery. There's an amazing breakfast place called the Hangout in Euphoria, which I highly recommend. There's a laundromat. There's the hiker center that the church has. Like, it's just an amazing town to stop in. It's super cute. It's like way out in the middle of the mountains. So that was my number one favorite. And my second favorite was Salida. So honorable mention to Salida. Salida is also just like an incredibly cute town. I could see myself living there at some point. It's also pretty walkable, but it, it's much bigger than Lake City. There is a hostel there. I didn't stay at hostels just because I was hiking with my friends Ibex and Dory. And when you have three people, it ends up being about the same price to stay at a hotel. At a hotel, you get your own bathroom. It, it just makes more sense when you have that many people. But if you are a solo hiker, often it makes sense to stay at a hostel. So just note there is a hostel in Salida. There's also a hostel in Lake City, though we did not stay there. Salida is known for its water sports. There's a river running through Salida as well. We were really hoping to rent some tubes and go out on the river while we were there, but the weather wasn't cooperative. So we didn't end up doing that, but we did play mini golf. And there is also in Salida, there is a an indoor uh, like heated pools, like heated indoor pools that you could go to, which we thought about going to, but our hotel had a hot tub, so we didn't feel like we need to, but that seems like it would be a great place to stretch out your muscles, especially if your hotel doesn't have a hot tub. And there's also this amazing breakfast place. I believe it's called the Pancake Patio or something along those lines, which when I'm hiking, I want pancakes all the time. And so my number one goal going into Slida was I want a hot tub and I want pancakes. And 
I got both of those things. The pancakes were amazing. My only complaint about Salido was I didn't think their resupply options were great. They were okay, but the outdoor store, their back backpacker meals are very, very limited. They didn't have a lot of options. They didn't have the brands that I really like. For example, Backpacker's Pantry is my favorite. Sorry, I'm being distracted by, um, there's a woodpecker on the bird feeder. So I'm being really distracted by that. So I apologize. But anyway, Slide has everything you want. The community there is also, people were so friendly. They'd stop and ask us if we were hiking. And we also had a really easy hitch getting into Salida. First car that drove by picked us up. So just good vibes. But as I mentioned, I loved all of the towns. Most of the towns you do have to hitchhike to get into, with the exception of Breckenridge and or Frisco, because you actually hike right past, there's a bus stop at mile 103.7. And on one side of the street, there's a bus stop and the bus goes to Breckenridge. And on the other side of the street, it goes to Frisco. And those buses are free. And I will note too that like, if you haven't hitchhiked before, I know that can be really daunting, but I find that people in Colorado are super, super nice and kind. Obviously there are always exceptions to that and you should keep your wits about you and trust your intuition and all that when you are hitchhiking. But I found the hitchhiking to be really easy most of the time. And I, I think the reason for that is that so many Coloradans are so outdoorsy and like pretty intense, like they do intense stuff. So often they've through hiked or done long running races or long biking races, things like that. So they've been in your shoes before. And also they're just happy people because they get to live in beautiful Colorado. So please don't be too intimidated by the hitchhiking. As I said, be safe. I always keep my pepper spray in my pocket as I'm hitching just to be on the safe side and my phone and my wallet, I'll put in my pocket as well but most of the time it's really not an issue. Also to note about Breckenridge and Frisco, if you are into slack packing and not opposed to that, which means hiking without most of your heavy gear, you can actually grab a bus up to Copper Mountain. You actually go right through Copper Mountain on the trail. You can take a bus up to Copper Mountain, leave all your stuff in your hotel and hike back from Copper to the jump off for Breckenridge or Frisco. So that's like 15 something miles that you can hike without your gear. And it's a pretty tough 15 something miles. So I would highly recommend it. Something else to note is that when you go through the Collegiate Peaks Wilderness, you have two route options. You can go the classic Colorado Trail route, the Collegiate East, or you could take the Continental Divide route, which is the Collegiate West. I've now done both. I did the Collegiate East last summer, just as like a week long hike. And I did the Collegiate West while I was through hiking the Colorado Trail. The Collegiate East is easier. It's lower elevation. It's more forested. And you go past Princeton Hot Springs, which is a really nice resort that has heated pools and things like from natural hot springs. So Princeton Hot Springs is great. It's this route is a little bit shorter. It's about six miles shorter, I believe. And it's, it's really nice. The Collegiate East is really nice. I really enjoyed it, but it's not super dramatic. If you want the drama, the epic views, the higher elevation, the more iffy weather, <laughs> then go the route of the Collegiate West. Just know that in the Collegiate West, a lot of the time you're up above 12,000 feet. So that means you're dealing with potentially thunderstorms, being above tree line a lot of the time, being exposed to the sun a lot of the time. But it's the Collegiate West is incredibly beautiful. It was definitely one of my favorite parts of the trail. We had some crap weather in there. We were hiking during a pretty rainy year, unfortunately. So we dealt with a lot of rain. So a couple of times in the Collegiate West, we actually like hunkered down because it seemed like there was a storm coming in. We hunkered down for a couple of hours. We let the storm pass. Then we continued on our way, especially because a lot of the times you have to go over our fountain passes, which are above tree line, and it's dangerous to be above tree line during a thunderstorm. And as I mentioned, the Collegiate West is a little bit longer. You have to tack on an extra about six miles. And we did not 
get off. We went through the Collegiate West pretty much the whole thing, with the exception of just the last few miles without resupplying. So we ha our bags were pretty heavy for the first couple of days in the Collegiate West. And I think that you, if you don't want to carry such a heavy bag, it would, it's easier to get a resupply half way through in the collegiate east like especially if you go and stay at princeton hot springs you could have a box sent there and you you know it's like halfway through and something else to think about is if you're planning to hike the continental divide trail in the future you'll be going through the collegiate west so maybe you want to do the collegiate east while you're on the colorado trail since you might have the opportunity to do the west in the future a lot of people also instead of hiking the colorado trail they will just hike the collegiate loop so that's the east and west together as a route that's like 160 miles or something like that, 170 miles. So while you're in the collegiates, you'll probably see more people hiking the trail than you've been used to just because a lot of people are in there just to do the collegiate loop. As far as navigation while you're on the trail, I saw people with different Colorado trail books, etc. But I would really recommend the Far Out app, used to be known as Gut Hook. They make these interactive maps that you can use while on long trails to see where the water sources are, where you can camp, where you can jump off to go to towns. People can leave comments and be like, oh, there's just a trickle of this water source, or this one's dried up, or this is a great place to camp, things like that. So it's really nice, and it shows you exactly where on the trail you are, so you know how many miles you've done that day, you know how far you still need to go. It's just really handy and it has advice for when you go to town, like where you could stay. It, I just find it's, well, first of all, it's lighter weight than bringing a book, obviously. And I just think it's just a really, really nice option to know exactly where you are on the trail instead of having to guess based on some features that a book points out. So I would highly recommend the Far Out app for navigation. Something to note is that there are actually not official campsites on the Colorado Trail. So on a lot of the other far out maps, you'll actually see like a little tent icon. It'll show you where these official campsites are. Like on the Appalachian Trail, you'll see where different shelters are. But those things don't exist on the Colorado Trail. But there are there is plenty of camping. And you, you can just pretty much camp anywhere. But there are plenty of campsites. So if you know, you're seeing on the Far Out app, like the next water source, people are saying that there's great camping. You maybe don't want to go quite that far. There often, there often is like other places that you can camp before that feature. It's just that since there are no official campsites, then the app can't list all of them, if that makes sense. Also like check out this sunset we're getting behind me. Speaking of weather, when you are packing your things for the Colorado Trail, you should pack for basically all kinds of weather, bring layers. You could end up in snow. When I was on the Collegiate East in August of 2021, we got some snow. It got real cold sometimes. I would recommend a sleeping bag rated down to 20 degrees. Um, definitely at least a three season tent. And also be prepared for some days that might be close to 100 degrees when you're at the lower elevations. So that would be close to Denver, close to Durango. Those are both lower elevation. They're definitely more deserty. They're more exposed. So just be prepared for basically anything. Bring rain gear. Some people think we don't get rain in Colorado. I promise you that we do, especially during the summer months. We get monsoons coming in from the Pacific Ocean, which brings a lot of moisture into the mountains. And we can get heavy, heavy rains. So I actually had a lot of days of rain while I was on the Colorado Trail. Luckily, it wasn't rain that was like all day that stuck around, but generally it would get rain for a few hours. So I would definitely rec recommend bringing rain gear and just be prepared for rain, but also be prepared for a lot of sun and be prepared for high altitude sun, which is stronger and can burn you as I mentioned. And definitely bring a puffy, like a puffy jacket, an insulating jacket, because it can be pretty cold at camp at nighttime. As far as water sources on the Colorado Trail, there tend to be a lot of them. There are a couple of places you have to do longer water carries, but nothing too crazy. I think the longest we ever had to carry was maybe somewhere in the line of like 15 miles. Definitely plan on filtering your water. I will note that 
the section of trail between Salida and Creed has a lot of livestock, a lot of cows hanging around the water sources, um, pooping in the water sources, peeing in the water sources, laying in the water sources, all the water sources. <laughs> like so much of that area is just like cow central. And then later in the trail down in the San Juans, there are also flocks of sheep that roam around the, <laughs> the trail. So for that reason, I would recommend if you have a sensitive stomach, if you're prone to stomach ailments, like I am, I filter my water generally for the entire trail, but I also brought some water treatment uh, tablets for the section of trail where there was livestock. Because I just figured like there's cow poop in all this water and, and it, the flow is not great for the water. Like that was also a section where water was a little more scarce. So just to be on the safe side, I filtered and treated my water in that section. And I would recommend that to you if you have a sensitive stomach. I have heard from like the Colorado Trail Facebook group that it's very common for people to end up uh, with stomach ailments in, in the section where there is a lot of livestock. So you don't wanna be one of those people. Bring a little extra treatments for your water. I'll also note that we do tend to have a, a quite a bit of wildlife in Colorado and we definitely have bears. <laughs> you are not required to bring a bear canister on the CT, but there are some areas where I saw on the Far Out app that people were commenting that bears like came straight into their campsite or even walked into their tent. There were a couple of signs early on in the trail near Denver about how there were some bad bears <laughs> hanging around. <laughs> So just, just note that people have had their bear bags stolen. Like if you're a person who just has a bear bag, you hang it up at a tree and just hope that a bear doesn't get it. I'm not, I'm not saying don't do that, but I will say that bears have gotten those bags here. And also that some of the sections you walk through, the trees are dead. And the reason for that is that we have a pine beetle in Colorado that has killed a lot of our pine trees. It's super sad. You walk through almost entire forests that are, uh, the trees are just all dead. It's, it's devastating, honestly. But in those areas, especially, you're not going to find a lot of places that you can hang your bag. And we just generally, like most of our trees are pines. So we don't have a ton of branches on our trees. Like it's very hard to hang a bear bag here a lot of the time. So I personally use an ursac, and I'll put a link to this down in the show notes, which is like a bear proof, uh, just food bag. And then I use, I don't know if, if it's OP sack or op sack, how you're supposed to say it, but it's, it stands for odor proof sack. It's like a giant Ziploc bag that's made to go inside of the ursac. So the bear doesn't actually smell your food. Anyway, you can just tie the ursac to a tree. You don't have to hang it. And it's, allegedly it's bear proof. I have heard of them failing before, but I've never personally had any issues and it's more protection than just like a classic, you know, thin food bag that you hang way up at a tree. So if you don't want to carry a bear can, which I hate bear cans, they're too heavy. They're too bulky. I honestly hate them. I see the need for them in some areas, but if I don't have to carry one, I'm not going to. So instead, my kind of happy medium is an ursac and i would recommend to you that you maybe bring an ursac too because you only have to like tie it to a tree you don't have to hang it and it just makes things a lot easier and you know that's my advice take it or leave it okay so those are the logistics of planning a colorado trail through hike i hope i didn't forget anything important if i did if you have any questions please feel free to let me know down either in the comments or feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, and I'll, I'll try to address any questions that you might have, but honestly, it's a pretty easy trail. You know what? It's a pretty tra easy trail to get to. It's a pretty easy trail to get home from. It's a pretty easy trail to like figure out the logistics of along the way, especially you the Far Out app. But yeah, overall, it's just a really easy trail to hike logistically. And it's an incredibly, incredibly beautiful trail. I love Colorado so much. I'm so grateful I got to experience more of it by hiking the CT. 
And I hope that if you hike the CT, you love it as much as I do. And I'm just the state of Colorado. Colorado is just the greatest. But yeah, if I forgot to talk about any of the logistics, you still have questions, just let me know and I would be happy to answer those questions. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more hiking, backpacking, and outdoor content. And please like this video. It helps me reach more people. And yeah, thanks for being here. I'll talk to you later.